Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, this uh, session is uh, Mastering Complexity. The theme itself overwhelms me, actually. <laughs> and uh, complexity um, is a word that uh, people may say that, well, we have always lived in a very complex world, and it's everything is complicated and complex. So what's new? Um, Today, uh, I have a very, um, with me, a very esteemed and distinguished panel. And I, first of all, I'd like to introduce everyone before I start the session. Um, to my right, left, sorry, <laughs> to my left, is uh, Professor Albert Lazio Barbarzi. <laughs> He's the uh, director for the Center for Complex Network Research. He's an expert on network science. And next to him is uh, Mr. Brian Gallagher, president and CEO of United Way Worldwide. It is the largest privately supported NGO. 1,800 independent NGOs operate worldwide under this name. And uh, Dr. Uh, let me, if I can pronounce this correctly, Ernesto Zedillo Ponce de Leon. He's the director of Yale Center for Study of Globalization, and he was the former president of Mexico. And lastly, a Dr. Angel, no, <laughs> Angel uh, Cabrera. He's the president of George Mason University. He's the author of Being Global and is an expert on cognitive science. So here's the panel. Now, leaders um, say, uh, and researchers uh, have shown that um, most CEOs seriously doubt their ability to cope with rapidly ex escalating complexity. Uh, there's a level of interconnectedness, the level of um, Interdependency is unprecedented. Therefore, it makes the world more volatile, more complex, more uncertain. And increased connectivity has created strong and often unknown interdependencies. Um, but do we really know what that really means? I mean, complexity. People may have all different imaginations when they hear the word. So I'd like to start out by sort of setting a common platform for everybody to understand the nature of complexity we face today by asking um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Barbarzi, Laszlo, uh, La Laszlo, Laszlo uh, to explain to us sort of the nature of the complexity we face today. Can you start out by... Jeez, telling that's, us that's that's a big role that explained but let me just start saying that complexity is really a big word and has lots of different meanings and i often say it's a bit in the eye of the beholder different communities and different individuals may have a completely different interpretation of what complexity means we need to distinguish as uh, uh, as we heard between complexity and compl and complicated there are lots of complicated systems around us. Our phone is very complicated down the line, you know, and so is a car, and so are many of the technologies that we use, but yet we do not call them complex. And the major difference between a complicated and a complex object is that in a, complicate, in a complex system, you don't always know what are the outcomes of the interventions. The interventions, the, these systems are highly nonlinear. They are not predictable using traditional tools of science. That doesn't mean, however, that they are random. And the reason probably we are here today is because there is a consensus not only on the importance of understanding complexity and confronting complexity, but there is an increasing consensus that with big data, with advances in the fundamental fields of science like network science and complexity science, we started to get and develop the tools to handle them in a quantitative manner. So complexity is slowly moving from being a metaphor towards being a science, something that can be measured, something that perhaps could be actually predicted and down the line may be controlled. I think it scares leaders to face complexity because we can often hear about the word butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. 
small decisions made by leaders can have unpredictable and very grave consequences somewhere very far away. I mean, can you, can you? Sure, I mean, that's exactly part of the fundamental paradigm complexity that you don't always know what are the outcomes of the interventions. A classical example, obviously, is the butterfly effect. Interestingly, within the domain of quantitative complexity, we don't think of the butterfly effect as being actually a signature of complex system. Mm -hmm. It is actually a signature of what we call a nonlinear system. But it is actually emerges very regularly in complex systems as well. That being said, the very idea that I intervene in a complex system and I don't have a full predictability about the outcomes of that intervention is really probably the most fundamental property of uh, complex systems. So if you cannot predict what your decision could mean to the whole system or your whole organization or your whole industry, um, leaders, I wonder, um, who face decision making, do they feel like the learning curve is very you know, steep? Do they feel more insecure? Are you more fearful, um, Brian? You're, you lead a big, big NGO. Um, how do you feel about this uh, world of facing complexity? Well, you know, just just to understand it, we've uh, we've got 1,800 uh, local affiliates in 41 countries, and they're all independent corporations, either operating as a United Way or operating in in a co-branded sense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so what that means when you have 1,800 that are technically independent, uh, you're, there are things that can go wrong in Moscow or in Mumbai or in New York, and it will affect the rest of the world. And there's no way you can keep track of everything that's going on in, in all those cities. So I'm not fearful of it, but we have had to change our approach as we've gotten more integrated in our work across the world, which means you start by values and competencies, making sure that you've got uh, alignment, making sure that you've got the right talent um, in the right places. So for instance, while everyone's independent, everyone shares a governance standard, a financial management system, uh, an information system, and we work hard to bring in folks who are collaborative in nature, purpose-oriented. So we're not, you know, you're not doing, you're not in one business in one city and another business in the other city. Um, so it's easier to get alignment if you agree on the same business, uh, and then and then make sure that the the talent work that we do and, and that we recruit people who are collaborative and uh, results oriented, network network oriented, relationship oriented, because what I've learned is that you actually have to give up some control in order to manage a more complex system, that you can't continue to control from the center the way that you used to be able to control. You, instead, you have to think horizontally and actually facilitate the learning and information exchange and monitoring of, of a network that goes horizontal, not vertical. Mm -hmm. Ernesto, you are in politics. I wonder if uh, politicians are more hesitant or more sort of become more indecisive in decision making because a decision that they make for solving a, one problem could have a very, very grave effect uh, in, in aggravating another problem because everything is sort of interconnected. What is your feeling? Well, uh, I think uh, complexity has been there all along uh, in every field and, of course, in uh, policy making. Mm -hmm. Perhaps today we have the tools to express, to analyze, to represent uh, complexity as uh, we didn't have before, but at the end of the day, if you are in uh, government or if you are in the private sector or in any other field, you have to take uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you react? Uh, even if you have uh, a better tool to understand uh, complexity, I think for me that's the fundamental question. Uh, from the perspective of somebody who had to take uh, sometimes very tough and uh, difficult uh, decisions. And uh, it seems to me, however, that uh, despite uh, this uh, new capacity that uh, people like Laszlo provide us with uh, this representation uh, and analysis of complexity, 
we always uh, should go back uh, to basics mm -hmm. because we must be humble, you know. Even if we are able to identify a complex system, uh, actually we cannot respond to a complex system with another complex system of decisions mm -hmm. because most probably we would lose control mm -hmm. of that system. So we have to be focused on uh, really a rather limited uh, number of uh, control variables. Uh, so that, I think, uh, applies not only from my experience in, in politics and government, but now that I am director of uh, a few uh, global companies as director, you know, if I try to have uh, a framework to analyze everything and to give opinions of everything, I will be totally useless. <laughs> So my, my effort, my intellectual effort, has to be on trying to identify some critical variables, which I will follow uh, carefully, and try to insist on those. I may be wrong, because everybody, any person can be wrong, but based on my experience, uh, I go for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my experience, you try to do that rather than be a, a control freak of everything, uh, you are more successful if you take a decision and say, okay, I'll go this way and uh, I have a higher probability of being useful. Angel, you are a uh, specialist on cognitive um, science and I wonder, leaders have to make, uh, time is of essence, they're uncertain, but they have to make decisions and uh, take the right steps. I wonder some of the uh, cognitive sort of traps that leaders could fall into when they are facing very uncertain, sort of ambiguous, but have to make decisions. I mean. In fact, uh, uh, to paraphrase Don Ernesto here, the problem is you, you cannot be a control freak to deal with complexity. Unfortunately, we are built as control freaks. Um, <laughs> the, the, the cognitive system we've been endowed with, in fact, make us uh, seek order, seek oversimplification. We're built to find, we're, we're bumper sticker thinkers. Uh, if you think about, even now that we're in a presidential campaign in the United States, the, the complexity of the social issues we're dealing with, and yet uh, we're sort of programmed to try to distill all that into, into some very basic ideas to deal with it. Um, the way the mind works is we, we find uh, basic theories that help us explain and predict what happens around us, and then you make us stick to those theories. We defend those theories. We seek evidence that help um, reinforce those theories. And it turns out uh, the, the world we, we, we live in, uh, as you have heard, is multi-connected. It is non-linear. It is not random, but it is uh, very, very hard to predict. And that requires a type of leadership for which we're not necessarily programmed. Uh, if, you, if you take sort of classic management training books, uh, where we, we talk about sort of top-down analytical strategic decision-making. You look at your reality, you analyze options, and you stick to a plan, and then you roll it out, roll it out and try to execute on it. Whereas, in fact, uh, that type of thinking is intrinsically at odds with the, with the, 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 the complex interdependencies that we're dealing with. And, and perhaps the only type of, uh, of leadership and, uh, and, and, and sort of management that can help us deal with complexity is one that allows multiple experimentation, multiple solutions, one that allows organizations to not just have one simple explanation of reality, but, but maintain simultaneously uh, multiple views, suspend uh, disbelief, maintain even contradictory views about reality. That's the only way you have to do it, but that's not the way we're programmed. So, so I think it, 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 the world we're dealing with, yeah, it's always been complex, except that now, because of, of what we have built around as the level of intercon interconnectivity, it does create unprecedented complexity, and yet I'm not sure we have fully developed the, the, the systems, uh, the management leadership systems to, uh, to deal with it. So can, I, can I tie those mm -hmm. two together? It, um, you know, first, Ernesto's point about um, making tough decisions. The best leaders I've ever seen are those that set a very clear direction. Mm -hmm. Could be a policy direction, could be strategic direction in a corporation, which then allows for the multiple, um, you know, scenarios and risk-taking to happen within that decision. 
uh, versus, you know, let's say in the NGO world, uh, you're in the AIDS business and a big opportunity comes along in the education business, you have to say, you can experiment all you want in, in the AIDS work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're not in the education business. So you're not, we don't want you over there. So it allows you to push down decision making and risk taking, and, uh, but it gets set by the leader first, and, or the leaders. Uh, that then, in my experience, then allows you to push down into an organization this idea of, of trying to innovate with, within the direction. Yes, uh, I think there is something very important uh, that comes from the title of the session, uh, Mastering Complexity. You know that? That's an oxymoron. <laughs> if something is yes. complex, you are not going to, to master over it. Mm -hmm. I think you have to start with that principle. I mean, you can understand the, the complexity you, up to a point, uh, but you don't master the complexity, you manage the complexity. Mm -hmm. And in order to manage that complexity, uh, yes, you try to rely on the most sophisticated uh, tools, but uh, at the end, if you really want to, to manage that complexity, you have to narrow down to a very limited uh, set of tools your decision making, otherwise you lose control of the system. But as Ange Angel said that uh, you look at the same things and you can have contradictory realities. That's the uh, puzzlement of the uh, complex world and uh, how can you try to manage better? Is Laszlo, do you have any ideas? Sure, uh, so well, what actually these are very excellent points in a way because we cannot really control a complex system ever. Even though myself as a scientist, I would love to develop tools to be able to control it as an intellectual challenge. <laughs> but down the line, we have to realize that the complex system is a moving target. It's time-dependent components, time-dependent uh, 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 interactions, and so on. So the question is, that what is that we can do? And I think that the previous discussion kind of alluded to that. One of them is to t aim to control complexity in the sense to limit it. And I think, I believe that's what you were referring to, is really setting rules that really limit the perturbations and limit the challenges essentially and make it uh, you know, uh, uh, less complex in a way or the other. What really complexity theory is focusing on is to identify what are the basic laws that are common across many systems that are complex. Why do we care about that? Not just because we like since Newton to have laws of nature, but the real reason why we really like to do that is because we want to know what is it we can change and what is it we cannot change. Mm. So what are the variables that are free and what are the, ver that, and what are the variables that we just have to work with? So for example, the, the emergence of hubs or highly connected nodes that very influential nodes in complex systems it's naturally emerges in all complex systems from the cell to the, uh, to the social systems. There's not, you're not going to re-engineer that. Or if you want to re-engineer that, you're going to have to make drastic measures and essentially limit the ability of the system to function. And there are a whole set of laws like that, you know, the natural emergence of communities, the, you know, the short path lengths, and, and the lots of properties of networks and complex systems that are so common in real systems and so reproducible that we say that they're really basic to the system. So once we understand that, then I think that the, what complex system can provide us is that tells us, okay, these are fixed, but there are all the rest of things that I can actually modulate. And, and, you know, and that's where really mastering complexity starts, really, is that how do I modulate, modulate the variables that are free to me such that I can, mm -hmm. I can induce change in the system. So how do you know what can be changed and what cannot be changed? What are the toolkits that are available now? Uh, well, there is a whole set of uh, toolkits down the line uh, uh, that are increasingly available. The bottom line is that they all rely on data. And that's where really kind of the whole com idea of big data and digital world is really kind of coming alive here in this context. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, you know, the way, you know, one way to think about it is that anyone who claims that can understand or predict a system without data is either a palm reader or a business consultant, <laughs> but certainly not, not a scientist in that way. And so we really need the, to be relying on data. But that being said, we started to have a number of tools coming out mainly from network science that at least let us to see the system, understand their underlying structure, and you know start to uh, start to you know draw conclusions from that. And I think, you know, uh, Hiroko has asked me to present a few slides from my previous talk that I'm happy to do that, just to show an example of how actually is being done in the case of an organization. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the slides should be coming up over there. If they are up indeed, then what you will see here is really an organization. An organization that uh, it's a medium-sized company in Hungary, 
And what you see is really just the list of the employees. The three colors correspond to the three locations where the employees are physically residing in Budapest, in the capital, and then two outside locations. And the reason we have this data is because this particular company had a major communication problem. They realized that whenever the leadership made a new decision about the company's direction, whatever that was, the, the decision somehow didn't percolate down to the workers, despite the fact that this is not a huge company. Or often the opposite effect was actually felt at the workers, mm -hmm. like the, the opposite news were spreading of what they really intended. So they turn to kind of complexity science and particular network science to say, let's figure out what is really happening within my organization. And what we did for them is that we said, okay, let's map out really who is communicating to whom. So it was like an online questionnaire where everybody was asked, whom do you get news from about comp company issues, about reorganization issues, about professional things, whom do you delegate work to, whom do you receive uh, jobs from, and so on. And what it did is that it turned this, this kind of list of employees into a network. And that network is now telling me, you know, who, where the information is flowing. And what you can see naturally, a couple of hops have emerged into the system that seem to play a very central role in the way the information and use and, uh, uh, is spreading within the company. Now, what I want to emphasize is that these are, this is collective information. It's not that these people said about themselves that they should be hubs. Other people have pointed to them, and therefore they emerged as hubs. Now, the natural question is, you know, who are these individuals? You would hope that they are the people who really matter. So to show that, we're going to put now the official hierarchical tree onto the network. And the red notes are the, the top management and the CEO, and unfortunately, you don't see any red hubs over there. <laughs> then the next layer is top management blue, and there is no blue hub either. <laughs> and if you really, you know, at the mid-level, at the ordinary management level, there are actually some hubs, and the biggest hub in the center of the network is really a gray node, which is an associate, a nice way to say it's a worker. So then the question is, who is this fellow? Because he's truly influential uh, in a sense that, uh, uh, that we could, could go back, or oh, I can go back, I guess, because pretty much much of the company is really within two links from him and doesn't matter whether which part of the organization that person is. And well, it turns out that he's the person in charge of safety and health within the company. And the reason why he's a hub, because he's the only person in the company whose job is to go from group to top and talk to everyone. He has links to everybody except the higher management. <laughs> so he's the gossip center of the company. <laughs> Information through him travels horizontally, never top down, never bottom up, completely horizontally. He picks information up here and passes it over there. Now the question is, what do you do with this? Because first of all, what this tool gave you is give you a diagnosis. You know where your problem is. What do you, how do you fix it? You fire him? Well, it's not really his problem. It's actually uh, what, uh, it's the higher management's problem that created what we call a structural hole in the network. You know, that, that really this person by his personality and through what the, his job actually naturally filled in. And you know, the recommendation we often have in these cases, talk to him. Tell him what's going on, because now you know who are the few people in the individual that if you inform them about what's happening within the company, mm -hmm. then the rest of the company will very effectively find it. The only reason we're showing this example is that to show that you know, there are increasingly tools that, that can be given in the hands of the leaders mm -hmm. by which you can diagnose your problem. You can see what's happening in real time in your company. And the beauty of these networks is that despite the fact that the system seems very complex and very volatile in time, these times are very stable in time. Whom you talk to, whom you get, whom you trust for information is really doesn't change over a day or, or a week or months. It typically builds up over several months and lasts for years. People may come, people may go into the network, but the ties remain relatively stable. So there is lots of predictive power in these maps. Mm. <coughs> may so, I? yeah, go ahead. Well, the, the fascinating case study. That, that map that you just showed, that terrifies most CEOs. <laughs> it terrifies most CEOs. Why? Because again, we're programmed, whether you know, if you're, you're a CEO, you're like everybody else, you're programmed to try to build structure to simplify. You want to believe that the org chart you've put in place, which basically an org chart pretty much represents a theory of the organization according to the CEO, you want to believe that that's the right theory. And you want to believe that people that you put in the right boxes have the right level of influence you want them to have. 
when you take a photo of the reality of the organization, you realize that your theory kind of stinks, that, that what, what you had in mind about how the organization works doesn't represent that. And, and so that's the temptation of saying, tell me who that guy is, get him out of here, because <laughs> I want to impose my, my structure as the way that I have to deal with the complexity of that. I actually feel like the only way around that is to dive into that complexity get into, into the network. It is in those connections that new solutions are gonna come out in that organization that are gonna be able to deal with unprecedented challenges. I always use the, the case of, uh, of, of an organization that used to be a terrific organization in the United States called Borders, that was one of the most successful bookstores in, in America, which is no longer wiped out by an unknown entity called Amazon.com that 20 years ago did not exist. It is impossible for me to believe that in one of those uh, bookstores that Borders had, many of them in colleges where uh, everybody was using the internet, that somebody in some of those had not thought about the possibility that the internet could be used to sell books. And yet the structures were not in place to do that. So my sense is don't, you know, don't, don't fight it, don't try to oversimplify it, just leverage it, to try to invest in the right type of social capital and, and jump into it. I, I've been using Twitter for the last few years. It's changed the way I lead, it's changed the way I manage, it's plugged me deep into, into that, that network. Uh, other CEOs ask me, why in the world would you do that? And, and, and how do you even have the time to do that? As if Twitter was sort of like a distraction or, or a game on the side. Whereas, in fact, it's become probably the most powerful tool I have to deal with complexity, to, to sort of embed myself in the conversations with colleagues, with, with students at the university, and so forth. And the bigger the entity, now that I moved to, from a relatively small uh, uh, school to George Mason, which is a pretty large organization, one of the most effective tools that had my, I have at my disposal. Can I just... Um clarify one thing. You're saying that um, there's overwhelming information and there's so much uh, communication going in the organization, but somehow the CEO may not be getting the insightful information that the, one of your employees may be having. Is that why? I mean, you, you have lots of information. Oh, you're, yeah, you, you're always, but, as a CEO, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're getting filtered information by other folks who, first of all, you, you rely on the cognitive limitations of everybody who reports to you, uh -huh. and potentially their agendas if they have some. So you're, you're, you're honestly, you're, you're in big trouble if that's all you do is in, 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 a, in a world that complex, like that, like if you rely on that. Well, and th think of it, it wasn't just the, the CEO or top management that didn't have a node, it was the level below mm -hmm. that didn't have a node. Right. And so the, the communication's usually going down and up, and it gets filtered by that level of management that doesn't want it to get to the CEO. Mm -hmm. And that's at least my experience, and that's why I think Angel is, is so right, that finding ways to jump over that layer of management from top management, whether it's, uh, whether it's social media or even just informal conversations with three levels down and younger people and new employees and so forth, is I was saying before we came out that uh, Facebook is the way that um, young people in our network, there are 11,000 of us at, across the world, that's the way they communicate with me. Uh, and they go, right by, they go right by their organization, they go right by their management, and they just give me suggestions, ideas, complaints. Um, even as simple as these old listservs, you know, I, I sign up for all the listservs of all the United Way professionals around the world just so I can watch what they're saying. And I watch them communicate back and forth and they don't even think that I'm in the, in the network watching and listening. Mm -hmm. uh, and then occasionally I'll pull something out and take it back to our team and say, you know, what, what everybody's talking about is this, not, not what we're talking about at the, at the management team level. We need to address it. We, I couldn't agree more. We've got to dive into the, mm -hmm. into the mess, if you will. So, go ahead. So, I mean, what I want to also emphasize is that we shouldn't really use this one as this you can do only within organizations. What I wanted to really show here is the power of mapping. And mapping can be used at many levels. It can be used within an organization, can be used to see what is George Mason's state, uh, position within the whole network of learning and understanding intellectual life, can be used to see where a country is actually between the other countries, and you can use these type of tools to take particular issues and map it out and see where the position is. Because we have a tendency to be ego-centered. That is that we, we, rightly so, we are the center of our network. 
And in order to see what the other, per, per, uh, other players are seeing, you need to see where they reside in the network compared to you. So you can see your competitors, you can see your, where you stand in the industry yeah. by correct mapping. That's right. I mean, and that's pretty much that's the only objective way to do that. And the challenge is, you know, you have to spend the money and energy and the resources and so on to do that and turn your mind around that this is valuable. I can learn from that. But, but I want to <laughs> insist uh, on the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important in, in my, because what has happened in my own profession, mm -hmm. uh, in my own field, in economics, the degree of, uh, let's say, mathematical statistical sophistication mm -hmm. uh, that from a perspective of pure knowledge has uh, my discipline today as compared to 50 years ago, well, it's, uh, you would say it's amazing you know, how sophisticated we are. But then when we see how dramatically we have failed <laughs> as a profession, uh, and the evidence is By the in way, front you, you worked for the Bank of Mexico, you were the finance minister. Well, but, uh, yes, <laughs> but I am talking about the most recent events, the yes, global okay. events. <laughs> then you gotta ask yourself, well, I mean, what, what is wrong? Mm -hmm. uh, why is it that we claim to have a capacity to model and to compute our models uh, that we didn't have before, uh, and yet uh, our profession seemed to be less useful than it was many years ago. <laughs> and I think the, the moral uh, or the lesson from that mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, you have to be very careful. You know, you can have a very sophisticated tool, but you are in a situation to, to, to take decisions, mm -hmm. then uh, you better be uh, selective about your first question whether your model mm -hmm is really dealing with uh, the complexity. Uh, and, and second, whether if you are going to try to influence that uh, reality, whether you really can do it uh, by trying to introduce a, a complex, a too complex system uh, of decision making. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, I mean, since I am interested in, in policy and results, mm -hmm. I think that's the, 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 the next step that we need to, the, the, to make. This is a fascinating um, conversation because I, and, and what, what you're seeing is on one side, say, hey, there are great tools for analyzing complex systems. And maybe mapping is one of those. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. A few days ago, a colleague of mine who uh, studies uh, geographic information systems came to show me his latest analytical tool where he's layering uh, social network information on top of geographic information system, where he's now been able to display not just how good or bad our brand is, but, but it's sort of like a real life analysis of what conversations are happening where mm -hmm. about our universe and so on. So there is the analytical piece. But I think what the other side of this argument is mm -hmm. when you're in it, when you're leading United Way or George Mason or Mexico or whatever, when you're, you're in, in, not on the analytical side, but on the acting, on the leadership side, when you're trying to make decisions, mm -hmm. mapping is useful. Mm -hmm. but what I, the argument I'm making is that traditional models of management and leadership are just awfully inadequate to, to, deal, uh, to deal with it. Yeah. And actually, Ernesto, you also raised a very good point on those lines because, you know, I think that complexity theory is about to undergo a transformation for the same reasons that you mentioned. Traditionally, complexity theory was like economics is, which is have simple models that have complicated behavior. That was chaos theory, that was fractal theory, and then, then kind of interpolate the behaviors to see to the large complex systems. So it was fundamentally model driven, and we prefer the models that are mathematically solvable, which inherently were simple. What is big data really changing is that we less and less rely on models and we more and more rely on real-time, dense behavior of what is going on in the real systems. Mm -hmm. So modeling has changed from simply having the two differential equations mm -hmm. that describe the system to taking this big flow of data that's coming from me and try to understand the relationship between them and try to have a real-time 
spatially distributed uh, picture of what is going on in the right. system and then make decisions. And I think that's really a fundamental change that the technology has allowed us that was not there 10 years ago. No, no, I think the, the, the technology and the tools are fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is how we are going to use that tool exactly. to uh, take decisions that's right. that are meaningful in the direction that uh, we need them mm -hmm. uh, to be. And so I think have... uh, eventually you have to be heuristic. Yes. I mean, you have yes. to rely on experience. You have to rely on those tools. You have mm -hmm. to rely on many things. Uh, my <laughs> warning is to do it until, you know, with a, with a model that it can be very elegant, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that is assuming that we know more than what we know. Yes. <laughs> in, so, fact, no, 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 in fact, if... if um, it strikes so true. I remember sitting in Davos in 07, as we heard everyone from the stage um, talk about how clearly they understood where, where the financial world was going and where the world economy that was, was going. Lehman, right? And then, <laughs> and then 08, the next year, mm -hmm. I remember sitting in the audience, and you know, I'm a social worker and have my MBA, but I, finance and economics is not my thing. But I remember, for you. yeah. So I'm sitting in the audience, and I thought to myself, oh my God. These, the smartest people in the world don't know what's going on. That's literally, they, it's gotten too complex. Mm -hmm. And either that or they're believing their models, which are inadequate for both the opportunities that were being created and now the challenges that had been created. And I couldn't agree more. It was, just, it was so clear mm -hmm. that we just didn't know. I mean, the good news here, of course, is that complexity theory will never replace the two of you, which are the leaders. Thank God. You know, right. what it will do is that it will provide you better tools so right, that you right. can make much better empirical decisions about what is next. So you, it gets you a better view of what's going on, helps you make better decisions. Or let, or let me have, offer a, an alternative. I actually even question this, this idea that there is a smart decision maker at the top that upon seeing all those fancy analyses and maps and whatever <clears throat> actually has the right decision. I question the very idea of there being a right decision when you're dealing with complex systems. And, and, and I, I, my sense, and it's only sort of a vague intuition-based sense, but that I think is, is, is confirmed like uh, uh, when, when I hear Gary and, and other leaders, which is you need to sort of not fight complexity, but in fact, embrace it mm -hmm. and allow complexity to even unfold in your organization. Mm -hmm. Empower many others to make decisions. Foster the creation of internal connections of social capital. Allow and train people to connect, to build bridges, to bridge, build bridges between, between cultures, between disciplines, mm -hmm. and hope for the best, and hope that something will happen. So then the question is then, do we really need people like us doing our jobs? And I think Gary had a profound uh, statement at the beginning, which is probably the most important thing a leader can do in an environment like that, is to remind everybody of the values, of the sense of long-term direction, mm -hmm. not of living in this illusion that we are the smart decision makers, but to embrace the fact that there is not a, a right solution, to just remind everybody of what is the long-term plan, what is the long-term goal, what are the values of the organization, and ensure you're creating an environment where those solutions hopefully will bubble up to the top. Very different from what we've been trained to in, in business schools and, and, and the like. So you're saying that the leadership competencies that are needed is not like uh, strong leadership, more sort of delegating authority I mean, how, how, do you, how do you make your organization more um, increased dexterity, making more creative, making everybody more collaborative? What is the style of leadership that is needed? What is the competencies that are needed? Brian, do you have an idea of uh, how to improve your organizations to well, increase I, opportunities from complexity? Well, I know, I know that when we recruit into our organization, and certain things you can de develop, certain things you can't. Uh, but it's, it's pretty simple. We look for people who are purpose-driven, um, and that can be in business, government, NGOs. It just, are you, are you, are you really engaged in the purpose? Uh, are you results-oriented? Importantly, are you collaborative and relationship-oriented? Um, and are you a kind person? 
um, that whenever I say that, people say, you know, so the leaders have to have vision. They have to be team builders. They have to be able to help create networks. They have to be able to give up control. Um, but, you know, we always look for good people as well because um, bottlenecks happen in organizations because you have, you have people acting not in the best interest of the purpose. And so even if you're purpose driven, but you're not really a very good person, and you know, you actually can test those things when you're hiring folks in and you can't, you can't make somebody go from, you know, being self-centered and so forth to being, you know, collaborative, but you can test it when, when you hire it. And, uh, and so we do everything we can to make sure we, we fill the organization, both young talent coming through the pipe, identifying those early career, uh, mid-career, and making sure that we're trying to move people up in, in the organization. So, so it's not like me, 30, you know, when I went to MBA school in, in the 1980s, it was all management by objective and command and control and top down. And occasionally we talked about ethics, um, but it's, it's, so I have to learn how to give up control and give away credit. And, and it's just, it's- You it's have a, to give away credit? You, you have, have to give, to give away- a, Credit only comes back to you if mm -hmm. you give it away. And if you try to take it, you really don't get it in today's organizations. Yeah. The, um, and Brian, I'm sorry I no, no. called you Gary earlier. Um, the, when we wrote this uh, book, pardon the plug, the Being Global book, uh, we um, interviewed folks who, are, who seem to be getting it right and trying to distill sort of what are the, the sets of um, competencies that are, allow, are allowing them to, uh, to succeed. We try to build relatively simple theory of a very complex phenomenon. But, um, but what came out, um, uh, to your point, was, first of all, one of those competencies is this ability of being able to suspend disbelief, to hold different perspectives of reality at once, uh, to be able to relate to people who may provide a very different perspective on one set of phenomenon, which is not very natural. We try to surround ourselves by people who confirm our view of the world, not people who uh, contradict it. So that's one set. The other one is the entrepreneurship piece. Um, uh, people who are able to connect the dots and use, use that connectivity with others to find creative solutions. But the third one, which in fact I think confirms what, what, you're, um, what, what you just explained, mm -hmm. is this notion of, of values, which we call global citizenship in our case, but, but is the question of, 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 of values. So from the standpoint of leader, if you're bringing folks who um, are committed to the sense of purpose, Whose, whose values are aligned with the values of the organization, uh, who have the ability to develop that kind of connectivity inside and outside of the organization, who are able to suspend their disbelief, to collaborate with folks who come from, from the other side of, 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 of a silo. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, that is the role of leadership, is how, to, to re, how do you bring that kind of talent into an organization and then set them loose, yeah. the best thing you can do. So it's interesting this discussion, and uh, in a sense that the, the leadership qualities have focused entirely on from the, on the notes perspective, mm -hmm. and and that's exactly what we face as a as a challenge in dealing with complexity is that our cognitive limit is such that we believe, and because we don't have any better tools, that if we want to make an organization better, we just put good notes in there. And we don't really have the tools to decide, is this node really fitting in that environment, partly because the environment is changing in time, That's the fair. players change, and so That's on. Fair. And so the question is, can we go to the next level? And I'm not so sure we have answers to that. But this is the type of questions I think we need to ask when we look at this big data, is that could we really think in not now only from the perspective of the node, which is given that we try to hire the best, mm -hmm. but also how does it fit into the organization from a network perspective, from an organizational perspective? I think that's a fair point, mm -hmm. yep. Maybe I should uh, ask the floor um, if they have any questions. Can you sort of um, raise the lighting in the, in the room? Ah, okay. I see a few hands going up. Um, first, I'd like to start with just gentlemen. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You have uh, basically characterized what are the values for the next generation of leaders. And that sounds very good. But my question is, for political leaders, are these values attractive for basically the population, for voters? Mm -hmm. Are there gonna be 
question. Able... Can, you, can you say who uh, you would like to address the question? Well, I would like to address it to the former president of Mexico, Mr. <laughs> Dr. Cedillo. Well, uh, let me uh, answer to your question by making reference to this uh, idea that uh, was uh, mentioned right at the beginning, which is uh, we live in a much uh, more interdependent world. We live in globalization. Uh, we have uh, incredible connectivity. The way in which uh, we produce, sell, consume has changed uh, dramatically. Uh, and I would say that uh, people uh, are not uh, really aware of how uh, complex <laughs> this system has become, uh, partially because the political speech uh, is not yet uh, made to inform people uh, of, these, uh, of the consequences, the good, the many good consequences, and also the downsides of that uh, interdependence. If uh, you listen to political speeches all over the world today, we still have the same instincts we had uh, 40 years ago. Whenever something goes wrong in your country, you, tart, uh, you try to blame others <laughs> for what went wrong, right? You have a, an unemployment problem, uh, you, and I say it here, immediately you try to blame China, <laughs> you know, because China is being successful. So I think there is a, there is a vacuum uh, between uh, this uh, new reality and the way in which uh, we communicate with people. Uh, we, are still, we are still relying in all notions, perhaps that they were, they were always wrong. But it's easy to, to say that, and it's easy to get agreement in people, you know, what you were saying. They, they, they listen what they believe, so it is a process of mutual reinforcement. But this is extremely dangerous, because uh, by reinforcing these uh, wrong notions, uh, political leaders may be narrowing their capacity uh, to execute uh, good policies. And I think uh, a good example is what's going on right now in Europe. Uh, despite the fact that Europeans have built the most impressive project of uh, economic and I would say political integration, in human history, and it's something that should, be, should deserve our admiration and recognition, the political speech has been such that now that they have, take, they have to take uh, further decisions to deepen this project, they are in a sort of uh, uh, death end, <laughs> political death end, because they have continued to tell in Germany, I don't know, we have this problem because the Greek are lazy or the Spanish go to too many fiestas or this and that, <laughs> uh, not to speak about other, you know, <laughs> other factors. And that, uh, I think, is, is very bad. I think uh, political leaders have the responsibility, certainly, to understand this uh, complexity and to transform their language and their communication mm -hmm so that they create the political space to, uh, to have uh, capacity to act, particularly in times of crisis. So I think that's... Uh, mm. Ernesto, I think I'd like to ask a sort of a follow-up question. Why do uh, governments sort of fail to create mechanisms for cooperation? I mean, it's such a collaborative world, but the polarization seems to be increasing and, you know, I think there are things that governments can do and they should co collaborate even more, but the mechanisms for collaboration just has failed. Well, there, there, are, many, there are many reasons, um, uh, uh, and let me put it a, a little bit in, in conceptual terms. When we speak about uh, international cooperation, so uh, international cooperation for what? Well, you need international cooperation 
to produce what we economists uh, call uh, global public goods, mm -hmm. right? And these are goods that uh, cannot be provided by the action of a single country. Mm -hmm. And in fact, no country individually will want to produce uh, alone that because it's always in your interest to wait for others to put their part to generate the, that public good. And also because in order to produce one of these uh, public goods, somehow you have to share your sovereignty. And this is politically yeah. uh, very difficult, particularly if you have been insisting in speaking to your public that you have to preserve a notion of sovereignty that perhaps was valid two centuries ago, mm -hmm. but it can no longer be valid in the 21st uh, century. So you have the problem of sovereignty, you have the problem of the free rider, and that makes it uh, very hard to begin with, to have that kind of, uh, of international uh, cooperation. Mm -hmm. And that has been produced only when you have uh, either exceptional leadership that goes beyond the immediate political interest, always acting in your own national interest. I don't think you can force any political leader to act against its, uh, its national interest. But you have to have enough foresight, enough vision to say, you know, this, what we are going to do, which in a way takes away some of our own autonomous authority, at the end will be in the benefit of our own people. So it takes uh, leadership, and it also takes uh, imagination to design mechanisms that are acceptable to others and to your own uh, constituencies. And sometimes we don't do it simply because we are ignorant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other question, uh, gentlemen, in the purple shirt? <laughs> I suppose this is a, uh, a follow-up on that discussion. Um, given that uh, intellectual honesty and denial is pervasive in the business, political, and uh, academic arenas in the world we live in, uh, how much would you say that sort of intellectual dishonesty and um, denial is a barrier to any understanding of complexity? I, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't call. Uh, I mean, there there are cases of intellectual dishonesty, but I don't. I don't call our failures to deal with complexity. I don't call that intellectual complexity. I call that limitations of who we are and how our cognitive systems are built. As I said, we are built uh, to produce, to reinforce, and to defend simple theories of how the world around us work. If, um, if you're trying to run a campaign in the United States, to your point, Ernesto, and to the question of what would you do with healthcare, you say, well, it's very complex, and there is not a single answer. And if you just do this, then there are side consequences. If you do that, then there are side consequences. And in fact, if you do this, we have no clue what will happen until you run this experiment. You're toast. You're not even past the early primaries. You don't even make it to, to, to the end. So we have a system that basically reinforces the production of bumper stickers uh, that oversimplify what's a very complex reality, and, and I, not all of that is intellectual dishonesty. So, for example, in, in, in the case of, of, of the elections going on in the United States, it seems like you either have to say government is awful and everything it does is bad, or government, there is some <laughs> hope for government, and, and that produces a polarization. What I'm very intrigued by, in fact, this conversation uh, gave me some, some ideas, and maybe some hope is whether there are any tools that, that people like you, Laszlo, and, and, and other researchers of complex systems, where there are tools that could be used to explain complex systems to the general public, to, to, to enrich conversations, to at least bring people along to a conversation. And, and, and I don't know if there are good examples of doing that, but boy, I would love to see stuff like that happen. Maybe one more question. Okay, um, gentlemen, on the, yeah. Uh, 
So thank you. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. Which channel? Uh, thank you. Which is the English channel? Oh, uh, English channel. Oh, okay. Channel one. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Yeah, go go. <laughs> thank you, thank you, moderator. I'm the journalist from the Tianjin Daily. I actually have two questions uh, for all the uh, uh, panelists from the, uh, on the stage. The first question is about uh, globalization. Uh, we've been talking about globalization, but in talking about globalization, uh, I believe that uh, we certainly will mention this uh, uh, common issue. I think that um, for successful enterprise, I think that uh, what is important uh, for the enterprises is to have the localization. At the same time, you have a different uh, policy environment, uh, legal environment, and uh, uh, operation environment. Because in different environments, I think that for enterprises, it turns to be very complex. And complicated. So how would you panelists address this com complexity in terms of environments for the enterprises? And the other one is about the uh, private investment, that is the policy from the government to go out and invest, and including the internalization of the RMB currency, local currency. So there is a tendency that uh, for the uh, FDI from China in RMB, but in emphasizing internalization of the local RMB, there certainly will be certain risks. So from the SOE's investment, it's not that smooth or that successful for the uh, Chinese or local enterprises to invest in foreign countries because they certainly will encounter difficulties in foreign countries from the local Chinese investors. Any suggestions or recommendations? Mm. That was a bit of a difficult question, but what? <laughs> I, 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 don't, I didn't right. fully understand. I thought it was very complex. Yeah. So I don't very know. complex yeah. question. Well, well, I'll, leave, well, I'll leave the RMB valuation to the economist. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but, but let me say on the first point that the, the localization, the, the, the and globalization, the globalization versus localization. Yeah. Um, that um, you know, the fact is that the only sector of the three big sectors that have globalized uh, is business. You know, business is, is, a, is, it is a global marketplace right now. And government hasn't kept up and civil society hasn't kept up. And so to this point about, you know, so business finds opportunity, they go where the opportunity is. If you don't get the kind of cooperation between government, governments, then you've got different regulations, it becomes very complex. Having said that, the most successful businesses understand this need to be local and global at the same time. And if you're going to do business in China, uh, you're going to have to deal with the, the political, economic, cultural reality of China. And uh, NGOs the same way. That's, that's when you get a decentralized structure and culture inside your organization. It's actually a huge advantage because doing business in North America versus Europe versus China versus Brazil is, is very different. So you can have a single business, but you have to run each of those local businesses as if you are a local company. And those that do it uh, better than others are more successful than others, in, in, in my estimation. Yep. Ernest, do you want to talk about the internationalization of the Rambin? Well, uh, <laughs> I think uh, I will uh, complement uh, your comment. Yeah. You, you said that it is, uh, given the difference in environments, uh, that it is very difficult uh, to carry out uh, globalization. Well. It's true, but today conditions are much better than they were 20 or 30 years ago. That is why we have seen this uh, amazing globalization of production. I think we are going through a second uh, industrial revolution in the world. Uh, 200 centuries, uh, I mean 200 years ago, we a little bit longer than that, we started the industrial revolution because there was a scientific revolution thanks to Newtonian uh, physics that allow us to tap uh, new sources uh, of energy to create new, new forms of uh, 
transportation and communication, and that, uh, with other things, uh, changed the world. Well, now we have uh, new technologies that have given us the possibility of have uh, this connectivity and uh, uh, communication that we couldn't have 30 or so uh, years ago. But we also had significant changes in the environment because we have had throughout the world a reduction of barriers for trade and investment. And that has allowed us to create a very complex uh, uh, supply chain that we didn't have before. Before, industrialization was about vertical integration, about creating uh, clusters, about creating economies of scale. And only when you had that, you could have some aspiration to become international and to sell in other countries, not necessarily produce in other countries. Well, today, you can become a global company practically overnight, as long as you don't want to produce everything, as long as you are willing to specialize, as long as you are willing to produce perhaps first only one component, but make sure that that component can be assembled or used in many other parts of the world. But that is possible, yes, because of technology, but also because uh, countries have agreed to lower barriers uh, to trade and barriers to services. And this is a good news, but it's also a bad news. Because the bad news is that governments can also raise again barriers to trade and investment, and that can destroy globalization, and that can destroy opportunities uh, for prosperity that we are enjoying uh, today. About the RMB, well, about the Yuan, well, it, it is up to the Chinese government <laughs> to allow it to make it fully convertible. Mm -hmm. And the day that it is fully convertible, then I think we will see uh, much greater possibilities of Chinese investment in the world. But of course, there has to be uh, also the attitude of other countries to be more liberal towards Chinese investments. We are past our time, and I hope everybody here tries to challenge their cognitive limits <laughs> to master through this world of complexity. I thank you, everybody, the panelists, and thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>